Thank you for joining us. It is great achievements and breakthroughs in human history and the research leading up to them that brings out the very best in us. The most important conference on human age reversal just took place for the third time in San Diego, California, and over 1,000 people attended this Revolution Against Aging and Death Conference, the largest age reversal event ever, with Bill Falloon, the co-founder of Life Extension, giving a keynote speech on scientific breakthroughs on inducing age reversal. Bill just returned and we'll join him for his update presentation. Thank you for the kind words, Neil. I think a lot of people here have known me for a number of decades. For those who, who don't know me, I've dedicated the past 41 years to identifying technologies aimed at enabling people to live longer in good health with no upper longevity limit. For the first time in my history, or the history of medical science for that matter, I'm able to cite a peer-reviewed study that was published earlier this year showing that Americans are slowing their rate of aging. And what we've been preaching for the last 40 plus years that aging is something that's controllable has now been validated in a very large epidemiological study. It's showing that Americans as a group are slowing down the clock of aging. They are not suffering the pathological consequences that our fathers and grandparents had to deal with. We're slowing it down so much that just over a very brief period of time, from 1988 to 2010, men have decreased their biological age over four years, women over three years. And what should impress this congregation more than anything else is that the degree of age delay, the decrease in aging has a lot to do with modifiable health behaviors. And guess what? That's what virtually every one of you in this congregation is involved with every single day. You watch what you eat. You get some physical activity in. You're involved in some of the more aggressive approaches using the drug metformin. You're taking care of your health and you're getting a big reward, you are decreasing your biological age. Bear in mind, this data reflects a sampling of the entire American population. It includes people who do not take care of themselves. But even these individuals are benefiting from technological advances. They're getting on medications that is decreasing their rate of aging due to type 2 diabetes, due to hyperlipidemia. They are doing a whole lot to benefit. And what they looked at in this study are blood tests that you all have done on a consistent basis. Lipids, glucose, C-reactive protein as it relates to inflammation, uh, breathing capacity, bone marrow function, and these are the measurements that they use to validate that we, as an entire population, are slowing our rate of biological aging. This is the first study ever amongst an entire sampling of Americans showing that there is a delayed rate of aging. Fantastic news for us. We've been talking about it for over 40 years years and it's finally happened. But what does that translate into? Well, heart failure, huge cause of people dying. And starting in 1995, going up to 2014, that's only 19 years, you had a 44% reduction in sudden death rates amongst heart failure patients. Now, a lot of that has to do with what conventional medicine has done and also alternative medicine. The combination of the two has resulted in a large decrease in a leading cause of age-related death. Uh, dementia, the, everyone talks about in the media that there's nothing we can do about Alzheimer's, there's gonna be an epidemic of it, and there's no way to slow it down or reverse it. They're all wrong about that, by the way. But the great news is there are four independent published studies that reveal that people who take care of themselves are not becoming demented the way that typical people are who abuse their bodies throughout their life. These four independent studies show that the prevalence of dementia is sharply decreasing. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't more people with Alzheimer's because there's more elderly people, but the actual prevalence of Alzheimer's and vascular dementia is plummeting dramatically. And it's plummeting because, well, we're taking better care of ourselves. And that includes guarding against 
heart attacks. We reduce our risk of heart attack, we reduce our risk of ischemic stroke, and we reduce our risk of Alzheimer's disease. In other words, what we are doing to protect our cardiovascular systems is translating into marked reductions in dementia incidences. These are four independent studies that I showed you in that previous slide. Four independent studies confirming that the prevalence of dementia is decreasing, and what we do has a lot to do with it. And these are some of the overlooked risk reductions for uh, losing our mind. The dementia, it can be caused by people not replacing their hormones, by eating poorly. And people at this church, we're watching what we eat. We're taking care of ourselves in ways that we're protecting our neurons the way we are our cardiocytes. Now, I put this slide up about a year ago showing that a study done in the Journal of American Medical Association, published in 2017, uh, showed that between 1980 and 2014, the number one cause of death, heart attack, declined by 50%. That's a 34-year period of time. It's trivial when you look at how long mankind has been around, but over that 34-year period, a 50% decline in the number one cause of degenerative illness and death. Well, some researchers at the University of Washington wanted to depict this on a map. And this is a 15-second video I'm gonna play for you. This map shows baseline, 1980. Lots of heart attacks, lots of strokes. Number one cause of people dropping dead. And the blue areas show parts of the country where there are reduced numbers of heart attacks and strokes. And the yellow and orange are showing areas of the country where there's more prevalence of heart disease. So what I'm gonna do is play this for you right now. And what you're gonna see over a 34 year period is the entire country converting more to the blue and dark blue color. This represents a progressive decrease in death rates from heart attacks. This is really magnificent that over 34 years we've been able to accomplish this much with the most common killer of aged people. I'm gonna show this one more time. Again, this is baseline, 1980. Lots of heart attacks, lots of strokes. No one really thought that it was gonna go away and yet technology emerged. People started taking care of themselves and over the 34 year period of time, the country slowly starts to turn blue and you can see the whole country, even in areas where people don't take as good of care of themselves as they should, the heart attack death rate declined very, very dramatically. And there are a number of factors that have to do with that that you all are engaged in right now. And we have talked about the prospect of age reversal in many, many publications that the animals are deriving benefit by reversing their aging process, and humans are too. This is what we're seeing. Now the media, they're picking up on lots and lots of laboratory research where they're seeing the animals are reversing aging or living longer in response to interventions. Some incredible news released this year. FDA has approved the Mayo Clinic to produce billions of stem cells and use them in clinical trials to see if they cannot reverse biological aging in people or cure or alleviate chronic disease. These are really major breakthroughs. American Association of Retired Persons, April 2018. Their magazine reads like an alternative health journal. They're talking about the science of enabling people to live longer and healthier and advocating that their members maybe plan for a lot more opportunities in the future because they're not gonna die on schedule. And National Geographic, they talked about our prophet of this church, Nikolai Fedorov, talking about physical immortality, people living for indefinite period of time. We've got the mainstream media picking up on what started in this church in 2013 and what started with my various groups back in the 1970s. That is advocating for the science to advance so that we all live long and outrageously healthy lives. Now, Popular Science did an investigative report. They were at this church. They interviewed me in many locations. They interviewed research scientists scientists, and they did a fantastic article about the prospect of aging being a reversible condition. They interviewed scientists at Harvard, Mayo, Scripps. They went all over the country interviewing these scientists who all said, yeah, we're reversing aging in animals, and we think we'll start doing it in people soon. Now, the scientists didn't believe in immortality yet. They didn't believe quite that would happen, and that's okay. So they portrayed me as the forever man, and I was featured in the article more than anybody else because when the scientists said my technology 
technology isn't going to enable people to live forever, I rebutted, well, it's going to enable us to get to a, an era when people will live very long, productive lives. And George Church, his research continues to indicate that if we can just live long enough, we may have a legitimate cure for biological aging that renders all, everything else we're doing perhaps op obsolete. If we can edit our genes in such a way that we put them back into a youthful state, we could theoretically achieve biological immortality. George Church has that objective. He plans to start using his CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology on 12-year-old dogs. And if it works on dogs, he plans to be one of the first people to self-experiment with this CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology. He's getting a lot of favorable coverage by a lot of prestigious media sources. They think he may hold the key to people finding a way to eradicate biological aging. He's a Harvard professor. He's got a good source of funding, by the way. That's really good news. He's got money, he's got credentials, and he's got technology that may enable people to live for a long time. Now, you've probably read in a lot of different places that the billionaires in Silicon Valley are putting money into age reversal research. And this is an absolute fact. These young people who have made billions of dollars doing the impossible, they are putting big money into research. The problem is it may not occur fast enough. They're younger than us. They don't have the sense of urgency that we do. The Google founders, well, they are determined to find a solution to make aging a manageable condition. They set up a company called Calico five years ago. Actually, around the same time this church was founded, the Google founders set up a research entity to try to uncover ways to slow down or reverse biological aging. Now, the breakthrough news is they've made a huge commitment with a big pharma company to develop anti-aging drugs. They're putting over $1 billion into this project to discover drugs to enable people to age better or maybe not age at all. Now, the problem with Calico and Google is, well, their age is around 35, 38 years of age on average. They don't have the sense of urgency that I do or that most people in this room do. We need to accelerate these technologies faster because I hate to say it, nine years from now, some of us won't be here if we don't intervene into our aging process. And what happened the week of RadFest, literally the week of RadFest, September September 17th, 2018, we're talking just a couple weeks ago, the Journal of the American Medical Association published three viewpoint articles about slowing and reversing biological aging. I didn't think this would happen for another five to eight years but they picked up on the science. The science is irrefutable, that when you give older animals certain medications, those animals have their rate of aging slowed. They have their risk of disease reduced, and in some cases, those old animals grow biologically younger. So JAMA published uh, information, uh, these viewpoint articles by leading scientists talking about people living a real long time. And this was the most pessimistic of those three articles, by the way. This is a Dr. Olshansky. He's a, a research scientist. He does believe that we're going to improve our health span. He's rather pessimistic about how long, though, that will make it. He, he's looking for people to live to be 90 to 100 in good health. And I'm looking for people to live 90 to 100 in good health and then go on to two or 300 after that. But nonetheless, he's uh, talking about the fact that we should celebrate and recognize the achievement of life extension that has occurred from 1900 to today. Because it's truly been remarkable. In 1900, the average person lived to be 47 years of age. And half of that 47 years was spent typically in a state of chronic pain. Just imagine uh, heartburn, esophageal reflux, well, there were no antacids or proton pump inhibitors to temporarily take care of that. Uh, injuries that were not able to be repaired. Infectious diseases, um, that 47 years it lived to, uh, on average, in year 1900, they weren't all good years. And yet, we've been able to accelerate our lifespans by using technology to intervene. This was one of the more favorable articles. Talked about rapamycin and metformin combined, perhaps adding 20 more years to the healthy human lifespan. 
Now, this has never been published in the Journal of American Medical Association. They are a conservative group. They wait for hardcore evidence to manifest before they usually publish an article. And yet, in the September 17th issue of JAMA, they're talking about people extending their lifespans by 20 years, utilizing technologies that you've heard about in this church. You heard about it the first talk I gave about the need for us all to consider metformin. And we've also talked about rapamycin. And there's many other interventions I'm going to talk about during this talk. Now, this is what I presented at, at RADFest as a stair-step approach to us, everyone in this room, reaching year 2030. The CRISPR-Cas9 will be perfected, and then aging itself will become a manageable condition. If we manage it right, we'll never have a problem. And so what we put there as step number one is rapamycin, followed up by NAD replacement, senolytic therapy, um, young plasma. And if we do all that, we make it to the year 2030, CRISPR-Cas9 edits our genes back down to a youthful profile. We're young forever, at least biologically. That's a fantastic, fantastic projection, and yet it's realistic. Now, we've altered that a little bit since RADFest. We're thinking at this point that if you're on metformin, if you're intermittent fasting, if you're calorie restricting, if you're boosting your AMPK through different means, you may not need to start with the rapamycin. You might want to start with the NAD replenishment, which I'm going to talk about. And as it relates to immortality, as you know, popular science referred to me as the immortal man. Well, if we are able to live to 2030, aging becomes manageable. We then knock off the diseases that are still out there killing us. We then look at protecting ourselves against accidents. We wanna make sure we make it into the singularity. When our neocortex will merge with the cloud, and at that point, through the transhumanist theory, we will achieve total immortality. Whether we wanna retain our biological bodies or not, that will be an option. Now, the technologies that we're going to recommend represent nothing more than tourniquets compared to what's going to happen in 2030 and 2050. But guess what? You leave this church tonight, get involved in an accident, and you're hemorrhaging, and you're going to bleed to death on the scene, and someone takes their belt off and wraps it around your leg and stops the bleeding, that's a tourniquet, gets you to an ER room where they can save your life. And you walk out of that hospital in a couple days as opposed to going to the Broward County Medical Examiner's Office and being autopsied and being dead forever. So tourniquets do have a role in being able to enable difficult challenges to be overcome. Our challenge is putting the pieces together. We know of multiple interventions that we think can slow down or reverse aging. And most of these are available right now. We want to put them together in a sequential order. So our age reversal battle strategy is to investigate what may be out there validate it in people who are utilizing it, and then disseminate the information to you so that you know what's working, what's not working, and how well some of these age reversal interventions are working. So it's critical that before you engage in any meaningful age reversal intervention, you get a lot of blood tests done so that we see where you are. And I can tell you a real sad story. Somebody spent a lot of money. They went down to Panama for some aggressive stem cell replacement therapy, and they came back. And they then emailed me with their blood test results saying, I'm not sure if I've improved. I said, well, where are your baseline? Oh, I didn't do a baseline. This person spent over $21,000 does not know if he benefited or not because he didn't do a baseline blood test. So if you are going to engage in some of these aggressive interventions, you got to get some at least basic blood tests done. We advocate a much more elaborate set so that we know as an individual, are you slowing or reversing your aging process? And then we can share that with the group. So an age management panel uh, should consist of as many different tests as you can afford, frankly. Uh, this is what we're recommending for people who are undergoing NAD replacement and some of the other therapies that I'm going to talk about. You get as many blood tests done as you can as a baseline, and then once you're done with the different therapies, have that same test redone to see if it really worked. If we don't do this, we're going to be talking 10 or 20 years from now wondering what is effective and what is not. And some of the components of this blood test panel that we suggest involves thrombotic risk. Over the age of 50, an abnormal clot forming in an artery or a vein, leading cause of death. 
thrombosis over age 50. So we want to see what your thrombotic risk factors are ahead of time. If you are at risk, we'll get those taken care of ahead of time. We hate to see people experiment with an age reversal intervention and then throw a stroke or a heart attack because they didn't have their thrombotic risk factors measured. We want to know what your inflammatory status is. If it's too high, try to suppress it before you undergo the age reversal intervention. Just imagine you're putting in fresh young stem cells and your body literally is on fire due to chronic inflammation. Well, those stem cells, they're going to be destroyed. So if you can lower your inflammatory burden, it's more likely that the age reversal intervention is going to be more effective. And we're going to look at hormones. If you are not balancing your hormones and you're going to undergo an age reversal intervention, you reduce the probability of it working for you because your hormones are enabling your cells to talk to each other. And if you're out of hormone balance, you're going to have all kinds of problems. And and as it relates to growth factors, well, we want to know where you are right now at baseline. Uh, when your growth factors are too low, your organs atrophy. You suffer sarcopenia. Your brain shrivels, literally. But there's a sweet spot. And we want to make sure you hit that sweet spot as it relates to insulin and IGF-1 with your age reversal program. We want to make sure that all happens. And of course, glycemic markers. Most of us have fasting insulin and sugar, blood glucose, and hemoglobin A1C. It's typically above what you want to be. I don't think people in this group are in that category, by the way. The typical American has fasting glucose way too high. And lipids, as it relates to cholesterol, triglycerides, important, but we're also looking at apolipoprotein B and small, dense LDL particles. We want you to do this again before you undergo the age reversal intervention so that you don't have a heart attack while you're undergoing therapy and perhaps blame it on the therapy. If you have high LDL, we'll lower it. It's not that hard to do. And a lot of these other issues can be corrected. Now, immune senescence, that's a little bit more challenging to reverse. But again, part of the age management blood test panel that we're suggesting is that you get the baseline for your immune markers, and then we can evaluate you afterwards to see if the intervention reversed immune senescence. We've had Dr. Maharaj talk at this church several times and others about the fact that if nothing else kills us, a defective immune system will. A defective immune system emits pro-inflammatory signals and at the same time fails to eradicate bacteria, viruses, and pre-malignant cells. We need to restore healthy immune function. And of course, we want to know what your kidney and liver function indicators are because some people are going to present with some early signs of renal failure. Over age 60, a lot of people, they have kidney impairment. We're hoping some of these interventions will help reverse that. So again, tragedy of lost data. If you fail to do a baseline blood test and you undergo some aggressive age reversal interventions, wow, have we lost data forever. We'll never be able to recapture where you were in the beginning. We'll know where you were afterwards, but we won't know where you were in the beginning. And again, going back to JAMA, this deals with the uh, process of age reversal known as synolytics. Synolytic therapy, they selectively remove senescent cells from your body. As we grow older, we have certain cells that we would wish would just die. They linger, they emit chronic inflammatory signals, they do all kinds of damage, including secreting protein degrading enzymes that literally eat away at our healthy cells. We need to purge our body of these dysfunctional senescent cells that really circumvent, circumvent the ability of the regenerative therapies to have their full effect. And to give you an example uh, of what these senescent cells are like, uh, just imagine you have an uncle that you were maybe not particularly close to, but he only had two weeks to live, and he begged, can you please not let me die in an institution? Will you please let me die at home around some family members? So you think, okay, two weeks, we will put ourselves out. We'll bring that sick uncle in there. He's vomiting, he's moaning, he's emitting all kinds of terrible odors, but we're gonna put up with it for two weeks. That sick uncle stays in your living room for two weeks, and it goes for four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. Your life is turned upside down. You really just want that individual to 
do what he's supposed to do. Instead, he lingers. And that's what's happening in your body with these accumulated senescent cells. They're spewing out pro-inflammatory cytokines. They're emitting these protein-degrading enzymes. It, they are killing you, literally. So getting rid of them is essential. Now, this study was published 2015. They took two compounds, a prescription drug called dacitinib and a dietary supplement that you can buy anywhere called quercetin, and they gave them to old animals. Those rodents had a systemic reversal of their aging process merely by removing the senescent cells. That's all they had to do to derive all of those benefits. It really shows you how deadly and toxic these senescent cells are in our body. We need to get them out of our body, and CNN has been recognizing it with some media reports that it's time to start taking this animal research and trying it out on people, and even the federal government putting money into senolytic research. They want to see what happens when older people have their uh, senescent cells eliminated, how much health span can be restored. This could spare Medicare from insolvency. Now, the popular press is picking up on the senescent cells by referring to them as zombie cells. And it's a very accurate depiction because just one senescent cell in a group of healthy cells in a tissue by emitting these metalloproteinases, these are these protein degrading enzymes, well, they're killing your healthy cells. They're like reaching out and biting the healthy cell and then spewing out inflammatory factors. You need to purge your body of these senescent cells if we are going to achieve our objective of living to 2030 when CRISPR-Cas9 will solve the whole problem for us. We don't have to worry about taking dacitinib and quercetin and all the other interventions. But right now, we're dealing with tourniquets, and we've got some really good tourniquets available to us. And again, the media is picking up on the fact that we need to do something about the senescent cell burden that anyone over the age of 30 or 40 is carrying with them, and it is shortening their healthy lifespan. This is a, a pioneer with the uh, trial on metformin, where he is hoping to be able to show that metformin really does delay aging and improve health spans, and he's also advocating, well, maybe before metformin, we need to get rid of these senescent cells, because whatever benefit metformin derives, the senescent cells get in the way. And it's not just acetinib and quercetin. Peptides and a number of different compounds are being developed to purge our body of senescent cells. And when that happens, they're seeing old animals grow biologically younger, including improvements in their kidney function, which is a real good measure of aging, because unfortunately, a lot of us uh, suffer kidney failure before everything else goes. Now, Unity has raised some big money to study senolytic drugs. This is spectacular, but they're not even starting their clinical trial yet. It's months away, and then it needs to go through the clinical trial process, the FDA approval process. We don't have that kind of, kind of time to wait. Great news, great news. The same study where they transplanted senescent cells into old mice, they then gave them dacitinib and coercetin. And what they were able to find is spectacular results, longevity enhancements by using senolytic therapies. This concludes our special show for today. I'm Richard Peretz. Thank you for being with us.